Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Collum, and welcome to this next edition of the Human Landing Site Study Hangouts, a joint presentation by NASA's Human Exploration Operations Mission Directorate and the Science Mission Directorate here at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. Today's hangout on paving the road to Mars, civil engineering at the human landing site, builds on the conversations that started at the 2015 Mars Human Landing Site Workshop for Humans Missions uh, to the Surface in Houston, Texas. But before I introduce today's presenters, let's get to know our HLS2 Steering Committee co-chairs, Paul Niles and Rick Davis. Uh, Paul is a planetary scientist in NASA's Human Exploration Operations Mission Directorate at Johnson Space Center. And Paul will be sitting in for our regular Steering Committee co-chair, Jake Bleacher. And Rick is Assistant Director for Science and Exploration in NASA's Science Mission Directorate. Uh, Paul, Rick, any opening words? Paul, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say I'm uh, really excited about this. Um, I think um, understanding the civil engineering and uh, properties of the uh, aspects of the exploration program is are extremely important for moving us ahead and uh, making our plans for everything or going to us. We don't know yet. Uh, and I just would add, I agree with everything Paul said, and then uh, one of the big thanks to uh, Dan Garcia and the team at ASU for hosting uh, this hangout. So thank you guys. And this is, and also thanks to Michelle uh, and everybody who will be speaking today. Um, uh, this is really an important conversation topic to be having. It's, it's a new sort of uh, area in terms of trying to figure out what we will need at Mars ultimately, and what we need to know about Mars in advance of trying to get crews there. So learning things about compactness of what the material, what we're landing on or what it takes to build roads or landing pads or launch pads. That's a really key area here and it's really intended to start exploring that option space, if you will. So that's pretty much all I have to say. All right, thank, thank you. you both. Um, and now let's get to know our presenters. So joining us from the Langley Research Center, we have Michelle Monk. Michelle is an Entry, Descent, and Landing Systems Capability Lead. We'll discuss some of the reasons we need civil engineering. Hi, Michelle. Hi. We're also joined by Rob Mueller from the Swamp Works at Kennedy Space Center. Rob is a senior technologist and principal investigator who will discuss how early missions might leverage local resources for civil engineering. Hello, Rob. Hi. Glad to be here. And to round out our cast, we have Dr. Pete Corrado from Bechtel. Uh, Pete is a fellow em emeritus there, and he will talk to us about long-term construction of Mars. Hi, Pete. Hello, everyone. All right. Uh, and feel free to ask any questions in the chat, um, and we'll pass them along to the presenters, or you can raise your hand using the button under the Participants tab, and we'll turn your video on so you can ask your uh, question directly. Uh, but with that, let's uh, jump right in. So over to you, Michelle. Okay, thank you, Bob. I wanted to give a little bit of background on the uh, entry, descent, and landings that we're going to be uh, performing for human Mars exploration. Uh, we are some of the source of uh, the necessity for civil engineering. So um, I thought it would be you know, good to give you a little bit of um, background on what we'll be landing and, and what our requirements are. Next slide, please. So um, entry, descent, and landing, you can click forward, is the process of delivering a, a lander from the top of the atmosphere to the surface and landing safely. So remember when we are approaching Mars um, directly, we're coming in at about 13,000 miles an hour and we need to to slow down and, and go to zero in about 125 kilometers in seven minutes. Um, there are three phases of flight. You can click forward. Um, entry is the hypersonic part, which is the really fast part that gives us heating and pressure loads that we have to protect our crew from. Um, descent is then the supersonic portion of the flight below about Mach 5 and for the human uh, uh, Mars missions we're going to be turning on engines and not using parachutes like we have in the past and then for landing of course that's the the slower part of the flight where we're trying to land precisely um, we need to extend our landing gear and these huge engines are going to be impinging on the surface so that's what I want to talk to you about today Click forward, please. 
So I think as we've discussed um, in many venues, uh, many conferences uh, throughout the past couple decades, we feel like EDL is probably the risky, riskiest part and the largest unknown of human exploration of Mars. And so in my role um, as a technologist, um, doing the planning for getting these systems ready. We're looking at 15 or more years to develop these systems. Go ahead. Um, just a little bit on the history to, to show you where we've been and where we need to go um, to give you some sense of scale. Um, in the middle part of the chart are all the, um, the past Mars landers that we've sent um, successfully to Mars. Um, I don't have Mars 2020 on there, but it will uh, launch this July. So we're really excited about that. Entry will be in February of 2021. And so um, these vehicles are to scale. So you see that they're all pretty small. Um, they're as large as four and a half meters in diameter or about uh, 18 feet. And that's as big as we can fit in the launch vehicles that we have. Um, we've landed about a metric ton or a thousand kilograms um, on the surface. Uh, all said and done, that's how much the Curiosity rover weighs and that's about how much Mars 2020 rover will weigh. So, um, but what do we need for humans? Um, we need an aeroshell that's about 16 or 18 meters in diameter, so 50 feet. And um, we need to land about 20 metric tons, all told. So I like to say it's like landing a two-story house, and we need to do it four times. Um, so uh, we'll get into what that looks like on the surface. But you see that we're really um, going a huge step in, in scale, in mass, and also landing precision. Our vehicles to date have had about, you know, from hundreds to tens of kilometers of landing site to area. Um, and we just land somewhere in there. We're not quite sure where it's gonna be. So we call that the footprint and it's pretty large. But for humans, we want to land them precisely because we want to land them next to the, the surface um, logistics and habitats and laboratories and power sources that are gonna support them. So we don't want things spread kilometers apart. So we really need to stick our landing um, and land on a, a pinpoint within the middle of a football field, essentially. Go ahead. So here are the four two-story houses I mentioned. Um, this is from uh, the architecture called the Evolvable Mars Campaign. Um, that's a couple years old now, but it's still very relevant. Um, the humans, if they're gonna stay on the surface for any length of time, are going to need uh, power sources. They're gonna need a rover. You can kind of see on Lander 3 there. They're gonna need an ascent vehicle to get off the surface, and they're gonna need a habitat to stay in while they're there. Um, so as I mentioned, we wanna land these within 50 meters of a target. Um, and we're making the ground rule right now that they must land a kilometer from each other to prevent sandblasting. And uh, that really gets into the civil engineering. And I'll show you some early simulation results that we have um, to kind of predict the sandblasting. Next slide, please. Now here's one. Um, notion of how we might land these landers and what the, the landing footprints might look like. So um, if we're going to send, you know, initially four landers to support the first crew and then build up uh, capability from there because we want to go and establish a long term presence. Um, this is what the, the landing area might look like. So you see the scale at the top there is a kilometer or about 0.6 miles. And um, each of the little icons is the number of a lander. So um, we have uh, the first one kind of in the middle there, and then we might land one, um, you know, more than a kilometer away um, within its uh, 100 meter footprint. Um, and then we need to, you know, subsequently space the landers around so that they're not too far apart for the humans to operate. Um, you know, we might have power cords or um, plumbing that needs to stretch between these vehicles. And so um, we need to make sure we can land these, uh, these vehicles very precisely. 
So that's just to kind of give you an overall view of um, what a landing area might look like. And um, Rob and Pete are gonna get into this much more. Next slide. Um, so this is a, a shot of Gale Crater where uh, the Mars Science Laboratory or Curiosity rover has been roving um, since 2012. And if you click forward, um, this was the 1997 footprint. So as I mentioned, 200 kilometers by 70 kilometers. So we could not have put a lander safely in Gale Crater with this kind of capability. There's a pretty good chance there we would have encountered something that would have uh, destroyed our landing. Next slide or click forward. Um, and then for MSL uh, Curiosity in 2012, we were able to um, reduce that footprint to 20 kilometers by six and a half kilometer ellipse. And this really has to do with um, the fact that we steered this vehicle as it was coming into the atmosphere. Um, we uh, employed some techniques of um, timing the parachute and we know our arrival conditions and where we are relative to the planet much better today than we did in 1997. So that's what's allowed this footprint to shrink. But you'll notice that it's still um, quite a long way from 50 meters um, in a circle. So next slide. So that's what we need. We need a pinpoint for the humans to land within. Next slide. Um, so here's Jezero Crater. Uh, this is pretty uh, big view of Jezero. Um, this is where Mars 2020 lander will go, a rover will go, and it will be picking up samples of uh, the Martian uh, soil and um, regolith and, and it will actually drill as well. Um, and so it'll put those samples in sample tubes. And that means that when we send a vehicle to pick up those tubes, it'll have to go to the same place, obviously. So this might be a, a candidate region to send humans because we will understand um, the soil characteristics there, um, at least in, in some spots. Um, and uh, we'll understand you know, what uh, types of minerals and um, soil characteristics the humans will have to deal with and work with. Um, so that's what we'll, we'll be talking about a little more. Next slide. So let me um, tell you a little bit about um, the new uh, techniques that we're putting on vehicles to allow them to, to land in this precise manner. I touched on uh, some of them. Uh, but Mars 2020, for the first time, will use a new landing technique uh, called terrain relative navigation. So um, using the great images we have of the Mars surface from high rise, um, we will store a map on board the vehicle as it's landing, and it will have a camera to pick out features and, ma and match them to the map that's on board. So the vehicle will know exactly where it is as it comes in for its landing. Um, so that will allow it to find a safe site within the landing footprint that it has. Um, and it has a capability to divert or kind of scoot around within that ellipse and move away from any hazardous areas. Next slide. Um, the other thing that uh, Mars 2020 has is called a range trigger. And so um, previous missions that have used parachutes have uh, deployed the parachute on a timer, but this time, um, we'll have the capability to deploy the parachute knowing how far we are from the landing site. And that really helps us um, narrow the footprint as you see there. So we can go from that blue ellipse to the red circle um, with just this range trigger improvement. It's pretty simple to do, um, but it's not that relevant for um, the human discussion because we won't be using parachutes for the human landers. Next slide. Um, so in the future, we'll have this terrain relative navigation um, type of uh, capability with cameras. And then um, as we move to the right in the trajectory, we'll have um, hazard detection. So we'll probably have lasers or something scanning the surface to give us a real-time map 
um, which allows us to land in areas where we don't have as good maps um, and they aren't high enough resolution. And then when we get down to the very end and we're about ready to land, we'll have hazard relative navigation or HRN on the chart there that will allow us to, again, divert or scoot around out of the way of hazardous areas. Now, this could also be avoiding a lander that's already been placed there. So this is gonna be a very important capability. Next slide. So we talked, um, I mentioned a little bit about sandblasting. Um, so here's one of our conceptual vehicles coming in for a landing. And this is a simulation of the plumes from the engine. And um, you'll see some temperature contours and uh, speed contours there. But what I want you to really notice is that um, there's a, you know, the flow starts impinging the service at a pretty high altitude. Uh, about 25 meters or about 75 feet and um, it starts uh, hitting the vehicle so you see the blue part that's dancing around there in the middle of the nose um, that's going to cause some unsteadiness on the vehicle and heating um, that we really need the ability to predict um, let's go to the next slide a, a quick question michelle uh, for sure. these um uh, for these simulations, what, what assumptions were you making about the surface characteristics and how does the, uh, the plume surface interaction change uh, under different circumstances, whether it's loose dirt or you know, bedrock, for instance? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, for this uh, simulation, we just use kind of a, a uniform um, particle size distribution and um, this is one of the main sensitivities that we need to better understand. Um, so we can make these really cool looking videos and, and animations. However, we don't have any flight data um, to, to anchor this result. So um, we don't know exactly um, what the effects are from landing on different surfaces. We know from some uh, unit experiments, we call them, or laboratory scale experiments, and just, you know, kind of engineering knowledge that if you land on, you know, deep sandy soil or regolith that you're going to deep uh, dig a much deeper crater than if you land on bedrock. But there are some, uh, some models right now that actually predict that with the types of engine pressures that we're seeing and temperatures, we could actually fracture bedrock as well. So um, we have a new uh, effort within NASA to try to better understand this and perform some ground testing, um, but it's going to require that we really um, have characterized the landing site where we're going on Mars. Uh, Michelle, a uh, follow-on question. Like, can you give us, or maybe you're gonna cover this in a bit, a sense of how fast rocks are being thrown out uh, in terms of ejecta and how far. I mean, uh, just trying to get a sense of the total hazard. Yes, um, I don't think it's on uh, one of the charts I put in, uh, but um, the, the width of the area, you're kind of seeing the impingement zone there is to scale with this vehicle. And this is a 16 meter diameter vehicle. So you'll see that you're directly impinging the surface on this graphic, you know, about 25 or 30 meters. Um, but in terms of uh, throwing rocks and such, uh, our simulations are showing about 700 meters, and that's how we pick the one kilometer keep out zone between different landers. Um, but again, that's to be verified, and it varies, we think, with the type of um, surface that we're landing on. So. Yeah. The way um, when you hear Rob um, speak about this, um, what we need to do is understand um, what kind of uh, pressures we're putting on the surface with simulations like this so that Rob and his team can figure out um, what, uh, how strong their binding materials have to be to keep the soil together, for instance, if they wanted to build a landing pad. So we're, you know, we're kind of uh, in, in uh, an iterative process in figuring out what are we going to do to the surface with our engines, uh, what environments are we going to create, and then how to mitigate those. And so as we learn more, we'll keep um, 
trying to close the loop on on that process. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Michelle. And uh, everyone uh, in the audience, please feel free to ask your questions in the chat or by uh, raising your hand. Uh, we'd love to hear what, what you have to think. Um, please keep going, Michelle. Okay, and um, just uh, one note on this, this, these effects also start around, you know, 45 or 50 feet above the surface. So um, I should mention that this is a, a conceptual vehicle that I showed you on the, the landing, the two-story houses. This is an um, inflatable aerodynamic decelerator, and it's the lowest mass aeroshell option that we have right now. Um, it allows you to have a large um, area uh, out in front of your vehicle to slow it down without having a huge launch shroud because this inflates when you get in the vicinity of Mars, but it's packed up um, inside the launch shroud um, upon launch from Earth. So it's a really promising technology and we'll be doing a six meter flight test of it at Earth in 2022. Um, so with that inflatable, Michelle, mm -hmm. Uh, when you're throwing ejecta up because you're hitting it with plume, is there a risk to the inflatable that, due to uh, recontact with stuff flying up from the surface? Probably. Um, we have not investigated that per se, but the good thing is that um, the inflatable is sort of acting as a shield for the payload. Um, in this case, and it's already done its job because we've gone through the heating and the pressure pulse. And so really it's, um, it's just kind of dead mass at this point, but we are carrying it all the way to the surface as you see in the simulation and not ejecting it like we eject um, the heat shields of vehicles today. One, because um, you know, it provides this shield against the plume uh, for us. And two, because we think um, it's very risky to be dropping off these large pieces of hardware as we're approaching a site with several landers and an established base. So, um, and that would be very hard to test and validate um, before we send the first crew. So we decided to hang on to that aeroshell and take it all the way with us and it actually helps. Great, Next thank slide. You. Mm -hmm. I think this is my last one. This kind of shows um, some of the cratering that can go on. Um, and this looks like it has three engines because it's a slice um, through uh, three of the engines, but it's the same uh, two times four configuration that we saw on the previous slides. Um, and that engine configuration makes a big difference. And that's one of the things we're going to be investigating um, as we uh, learn more about these simulations, more about um, the effects on the vehicle when we turn these engines on and they're interacting with the ground. Um, but you'll see pretty, um, you can't really pick out a, a depth here, but these could be, you know, several tens of centimeters deep. And so it's probably going to be very important with these payloads that we can uh, these landers that we can get rovers off and we can hook things together. So leveling is going to be an important aspect um, and you see what we're doing to the surface. So then we'll have to rely on on Rob and Pete and their teams to fix it all. So I think that's my last slide. I just wanted to kind of set the stage um, for, you know, some of the reasons why we need civil engineering. So uh, I, Michelle, this work, I've got one more question for you. Uh, so obviously you're working on the entry, descent, and landing part. What about ascent? Um, you know where the vehicle is. Uh, um, it's it's you got to accelerate it, so it's not moving real fast, and you are burning those engines constantly to build up momentum. So how does which do you worry about more, or do you have an, uh, or do you know that part well enough to be able to have an opinion about? It? Um. I'll give you my opinion. We haven't done a whole lot of work on the plumes from the ascent. Um, you know, obviously they're going to be a concern in that um, we're again firing engines onto the surface in the vicinity of other things. And um, I think it it's really critical to what extent you expect to use what you have left over on the ground, like the platform that you landed on. You know, if it has uh, power systems or radiators that could be useful, then you certainly don't want to destroy those on ascent. Um, so we have not looked at those configurations too much yet, but we know that, 
you know, firing engines into a closed um, environment, you know, like cylinder, we call it, you know, fire in the hole, um, that's bad. So <laughs> that builds up pressures and, and all kinds of bad things. So um, we're going to have to look closely at maybe uh, some reconfiguration of the landers between the time they touch down and um, the one that has the ascent vehicle, uh, the time that that ascent vehicle leaves. So it's definitely a concern. And I'll just mention that we are, you know, looking at these effects for the moon. And this is one place where our methodologies um, in testing and modeling um, can be applied from the moon to Mars. The physics are very different because the uh, the regolith on the moon is very different from that on Mars, and so is the surface compactness. Um, but once we understand how to characterize and model these things, we can apply the same approaches um, to Mars. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much, you. Michelle. And with that, uh, I think we'll turn things over to Rob. So, Rob, is that your next slide? All right. Michelle, is this more of your presentation or is this Rob's? Uh, that's a, one of my backup charts, I think. <laughs> there, we there we go. go. All right. Over to you, Rob. Thank you very much, Michelle. Sure. OK. Can you see me? Yep. Yeah, coming through great. Whenever you're ready. All right. Now, now that we're on the surface, uh, we're out of the, the aerospace world. We're into the domain of civil engineering. And civil engineering is all about civilization and how civilization interacts with its environment. So the very first thing we have to consider when we're talking about civil engineering is what is the environment we're operating in? Next slide, please. So the environment on Mars is, is very different than the environment on Earth. It's also very different than the environment on the moon. Um, on Mars, we have three-eighths gravity. On the moon is one-sixth grav of Earth's gravity. And of course, on Earth, it's, it's one G. Uh, so the, the gravity right away is, is a, a big factor. And we have a, a very soft vacuum on Mars. On the moon, we have a hard vacuum. On, on Earth, we have uh, one full atmosphere. And so, so that's uh, another important consideration. Dust is, is everywhere on Mars, and it's, it's a very fine dust that, that blows around the planet with the winds. Uh, so we have a Martian day, it's uh, 25 Earth hours long. We call that a sol, and so that's important too. And the seasons, Mars does have a, a summer and a winter and, and a spring and a fall, so uh, that has to be taken into consideration. Uh, there are extreme temperatures on Mars, although at, at the equator on a, on a nice day, it's, it's maybe 20 degrees Celsius, so, but it does get very cold as well. Uh, different areas of Mars and also different altitudes, so that's something to take into consideration. Uh, there, there is radiation uh, coming in from outer space on Mars, and uh, that is hazardous for humans and for computers. Uh, you can have a single event upset on a computer and uh, cause a, a real problem on your equipment. Uh, because it's so dry, the electrostatics and charging and, and these uh, fine particles are being blown around on the surface of Mars. You have what they call tribal charging. When the particles rub against each other, everything charges up and you have electrostatic effects. Uh, solar flux, uh, we would like to use solar power, but unfortunately we're not that close to the sun. So we do have uh, reduced solar flux and, and that affects the amount of energy we can harvest from the sun. Uh, magnetic fields, uh, it's inconsistent. It's, it's not like it is on Earth. And so that has to be considered. Uh, soil characteristics, this is very important for civil engineering because civil engineering uh, relies on having good foundations. And uh, if, if you don't know what your soil characteristics are, you, you can't predict your foundation. And, and that's really very basic. Uh, you have to know that. Uh, on the other hand, there's also ice in the soil, Mars was covered by oceans of water and then they, uh, they disappeared. And, and most of that water is thought to be subsurface in the regolith. And so we, we can have vast sheets of ice and glaciers. So we're, we're talking about that kind of material too. And then the subsurface geology gives you context. It's, uh, there's even still seismic activity on Mars today. 
And so th these are all important considerations when you're putting up a structure. Uh, the dynamics and the stability of the structure depend on knowing what that environment is, and seismic is one of the inputs. And finally, planetary protection. If we're going to go look for life in the solar system and the universe, and we go to Mars, if we contaminate Mars and discover something that we ourselves brought, that would be a false positive and uh, could be very confusing for the scientists. So we go to great lengths to uh, not contaminate Mars so we don't have these uh, uh, false positive uh, results. Next slide, please. Uh, a quick question we've got from the audience from Sarah Seats, and uh, I think Rob and Michelle, maybe you can both chime in on this one. Um, as landing techniques continue to evolve, do you see yourselves A, selecting sites for regolith quality, or B, using heat from engines to improve surface consistency, even if the heat is only present for a short duration? Um, Rob, Michelle, one of you feel like you want to touch on this? Well, I, I'll take that. Um... You, you should know what the surface is before you try to interact with it with a rocket engine plume. Uh, it's going to be hard to do because we won't have landed there before we land these large vehicles unless we send a what we call a robotic precursor, which is a smaller lander that could then uh, test the soil and, and make sure its, um, uh, its properties are known. As far as having a rocket engine uh, do something during landing is highly unlikely uh, that you could stabilize the surface with a rocket engine because it's such a dynamic event that it, it would be uh, just uh, excavating the surface. It's it's a short duration, it's high heat, but also a, a lot of uh, velocity, hot gases. So I, I don't think that's going to happen. But we we will we are looking at all kinds of methods of mitigating the rocket engine plume. Uh, the solution hasn't been selected yet, but we have a, a, a large trade matrix where we're looking at, at many different ways of mitigating that plume. Yeah, thank you. Anything you want to add, Michelle? No, I would agree. I guess um, on the, the animation I showed, you could see how unsteady those um, plumes are, as Rob said. and. Um, you know, that's not even throttling engines, that's at, you know, a constant throttle. So there's just inherent variability, um, as well as all the interactions that are going on between the, the changing uh, surface topography and that big vehicle um, and the atmosphere. So um, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not very um, uniform, I'd say. All right, thank you both. And thank you for that question, Sarah. Please keep going, Rob. Now, the next thing is once you understand your environment, you have to change your mindset. It's, it's everything you have on Mars is a resource, but we have to understand what are the resources and how can we use them. And that's where human ingenuity comes in. First, you have to do the science to understand what we have, and then you have to be creative and apply human ingenuity to try to do something with the resources. So in, in broad terms, we have three resources on Mars. We have the atmosphere, which is 95.5% carbon dioxide. Well, that means you have a lot of carbon and a lot of oxygen. So that's a, a good ingredient for your planetary engineering. And then we have water. Well, uh, water is hydrogen and oxygen, also very useful elements that we can use in chemical engineering and other types of um, activities. And then we have the soil, which we also call the regolith. And so in the regolith, we have minerals and the, the minerals are in rock form. And so these minerals can be mined and then broken up and processed. And so for example, you'll see that uh, there's a lot of oxides in the regolith. In the li list on the left, you'll see that there's many oxides. So, so by digging, we can extract oxygen from the regolith. But there's also water, and water is really the preferred solution if you're trying to get oxygen, and if, because that's good for breathing air. Uh, water is also good for radiation shielding. It's uh, good for human consumption. It's good for growing plants. And finally, it's good for uh, rocket propellant. And you can take uh, the water, the hydrogen, 
you can split into hydrogen and oxygen through electrolysis, and then you can use the uh, carbon in the atmosphere in a Sabatier process to make methane. And now you have uh, oxygen and methane as a propellant, or if you have a lot of water, you could even use oxygen and hydrogen as a propellant to come home. When we go to Mars, we will bring the ascent stage, will be empty, it's too heavy. And so we will bring it empty, no propellant, and we'll make propellant on Mars. So the astronaut's ride home depends on making that propellant on Mars. And uh, so it becomes very important to understand what your resources are and, and how to use them. Now on the right, I put a list here, resources of interest. Of all these minerals that are out there, what we'd like to go after is the oxygen, the water, the hydrogen, metals, silicon, gases, aggregates, binders, and energy. So for civil engineering, for example, aggregates uh, are very important. Concrete is made of, of an aggregate and a binder. We have a lot of aggregates on Mars. If we can invent a binder, uh, then we'll have unlimited concrete on Mars for human construction activities. Uh, we have uh, some knowledge from the Viking, Mars, MSL, all the missions that have been out there. And uh, we're fortunate in that we have ground truth, which means these rovers driving around on the surface on Mars, and they're really informing uh, us very well uh, what, what's going on there. However, Mars is a complex geology. It, it's not the same everywhere you go on Mars. The geology varies. So just because you understood one part of Mars doesn't mean you understand another part of Mars. So when you choose your landing site, that will become an important consideration is do you really understand your environment at your landing site? Uh, next slide, please. Now here's a, a picture of sand dunes on Mars. And this is important because it shows how much regolith is really there. It's abundant, it's a resource that we can use and we can sinter it, we can bind it, we can uh, mine it and break it up into its elements and then recombine the elements into useful compounds. So th there's many things you can do with the regolith. And that's really what a good planetary engineer has to do is reimagine the art of the possible by taking the local resources and then your needs and trying to adjust those resources and recombine them through some clever engineering and science into something useful. So when you understand that there are a lot of resources on Mars, then it boils down to how can I invent a technology to take advantage of these resources? So that's the mindset that really is necessary. Next slide, please. And we got uh, one more question from Timofey in the, in the chat. Um, is it vital for the perchlorates present in Martian regolith to be removed prior to the regolith being used for other purposes? And maybe you could just start by uh, letting us know what a perchlorate is and why, why someone would be concerned about it. Yeah, perchlorates have been found in the regolith on Mars and perchlorates are toxic to humans. However, perchlorates are also a resource. So maybe you can uh, look at it both ways. Uh, if you have to remove the perchlorates to uh, eliminate the danger to humans, then you can mine the perchlorates and treat them as a resource. Uh, but the, the story on perchlorates is, is still not uh, over. We still need to uh, understand the perchlorates more and the mitigations for that. And even though the perchlorates are toxic to humans, uh, there are many different ways of dealing with them. And uh, we, we still haven't really uh, done the necessary work to, to find solutions for that. But it's not a showstopper like uh, some people have, have tried to make out. So perchlorates are there, but we think we can deal with them. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Rob. So moving on in this area of civil engineering, uh, now that we understand the environment and we understand that we do have resources on Mars, what can we do with those resources? And we've put together a work breakdown structure here of uh, the possible requirements we have when we try to set up a civilization on another planet. And this is really what lets the humans survive. When you have infrastructure, 
you have shelter. And so the basic human need uh, for any human is shelter, food, security, water, good health. These are all basic human needs and civil engineering satisfies those human needs. It, it has solutions uh, for these human necessities. What we're talking about doing is using the local regolith and other resources, and we extract metals, we make concrete, we might uh, grow plants and make biopolymers and use those as binders. This is totally up to us. We have to have the imagination and the ingenuity to come up with the technologies to transform these resources into useful materials. Once we have the materials, First thing you do when you do civil engineering is you do site planning and design. Just like building a house, you go to your greenfield site, you say, what is my topography? You survey it, and then you test the soil, see what the compaction is, see if it's a good foundation, and uh, you, you develop the site and you prepare the site. After that, you need construction materials, things like concrete and steel and polymers. Uh, once you have the construction materials and you've done your site preparation, now we're looking at two classes of construction. We have horizontal construction and vertical construction. So and Rob, talking about Rob, just for pacing purposes, you got about five minutes left. So just to keep okay. that in mind. So I'll be talking about horizontal construction. People will be talking about vertical construction. And then we have to remember there's a life cycle and maintenance, including decommissioning and uh, recycling, for example. So next slide, please. So here's a list of possible infrastructure that could be built on Mars. And one of the first things we might need is launch and landing pads for all the reasons that Michelle just went into. And we're working on solutions for that. But then here's a long list of other things we might need to build. Next slide. Here's uh, some ideas for how to uh, build equipment that would prepare the site for landing landing uh, pad. You can see the rocket engine plume is interacting. That's what we're showing there's the Morpheus vehicle, which was a small uh, test uh, lander that we built at NASA to test uh, oxygen, methane, propulsion. And you can see in that computational fluid dynamics graphic that the, the plume is intense under the engine and then it scours the surface and it blows the regolith away and ejecta, regolith and small rocks. And you can see the velocities are color coded there. Next slide, please. Now, finally, if we have these uh, capabilities for construction using local materials uh, and making propellants from local materials, now we can start to imagine what would a spaceport look like, a spaceport on Mars. And this is just an artist's impression of a Martian spaceport. And what it looks like is not that important. It probably will not look like this. But what you can see is the functions that are necessary. You have a landing pad right here, a vehicle. You have some berms, which might protect you from the ejecta coming off of the landing or the launch. So this is a landing launch facility. You have excavators, they acquire the regolith so you can now make concrete and other materials out of the regolith. You have inflatable cryogenic tanks. So when you make the propellant by extracting the water out of the soil or from the atmosphere, you have to store the propellants. So you store them in these, in these vessels, in these tanks. Uh, then you have regolith processing plants in the background there. That's where they, they're making the propellant. You have atmosphere processing plants. And that gives you the mission consumables storage and distribution system, which are these little tanker trucks that shuttle between the propellant depot and the launch vehicle. So these are all just functions and ideas for uh, facilities that we could build on Mars using local resources and that would completely make life much better for astronauts visiting Mars. And the idea is that we do this robotically before the astronauts arrive. And once they arrive, they have a, a nice, comfortable existence. I think that's my last slide. All right, thank you very much, Rob. Uh, we do have two questions in the chat. Um, one from Bob Moses, can, oops, I lost it. Can uh, plastics be made from the carbon and hydrogen on Mars? And can those plastics serve as binders for some concrete applications? They suggest perhaps not for high heat applications. Uh, yes, there has been some research done on that. Uh, polyethylene 
can be uh, fairly easily made from the hydrogen and the carbon that, that you can find on Mars. So that, that's a possibility. And of course, we haven't really looked at this much. So we're relying on all the bright chemical engineers out there to give us more solutions on how we could do chemical engineering to uh, create more hydrogen uh, carbon polymers. Another way of doing it would be to grow plants and then make biopolymers. And uh, I guess Lauren has a similar question or maybe you uh, could expand a little bit, um, but uh, what, what are we thinking of using as binders for concrete and other building block materials? So you mentioned biopolymers and maybe from hydrogen and carbon, are there any others under consideration? Yeah, uh, really, if we're going to make a concrete uh, on Mars, we need two things. We need the aggregate and the binder. Well, there's plenty of aggregate, that's not an issue. So the next question is, what should the binder be? Well, in civil engineering, you have two types of concrete. You have hydraulic concrete and non-hydraulic concrete. Hydraulic concrete requires water to start a hydration reaction in a chemical process that then creates a binder. So that, that's a water-based chemical reaction. On a non-hydraulic concrete, you use a completely different material which doesn't necessarily react things like thermoplastics are polymer chains that entangle and when you heat them up they change state from a solid into a fluid but when you cool them down then the, the polymer chains entangle again become a solid so that's a non-hydraulic binder so right now we're looking at all possibilities uh, you could use geopolymers uh, which are mineral based with water to create a binder or you could maybe use a a, a plastic type of a thermoplastic binder. And that's still an active area of research. So we also need your help, all the bright uh, engineers, students, and, and other inventors out there. We, we need your help on that. All right, thank you very much, Rob. And with that, I think we'll jump over to Pete's uh, presentation. I think- These are backup slides, if anybody's interested on more about Mars uh, environment. Uh, one, one quick other one from Sarah. Uh, in a similar vein, do we see ourselves developing simulants that approximate the clay qualities observed uh, in Michelle's slides? So are we, are we trying to build simulate, simulants to figure out uh, their properties as construction materials? Uh, simulants are important, regular simulants, because it lets us do experiments on Earth that uh, lets us validate the technologies we're developing. And, and that's a whole uh, area of research. Creating a, a very high fidelity simulant is not easy. And uh, first we have to know what we're trying to simulate and then we have to find uh, an analog, an earth analog for that. So that's an active area of research uh, that is happening right now. All right, thank you very much, Rob. Uh, and with that, we'll turn things over to Pete. Pete, I think we got your slides up. If you wanna <laughs> jump right in. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, thanks to my colleagues from NASA. I am a civil engineer and uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to work with uh, folks who deal with, you know, high-end engineers and scientists all day long. And folks on this slide, this is who I deal with all day long. So I have a, maybe a little different mindset when it comes to complexity of, of what gets done. And we have a number of sayings, obviously, that go around on a job site. Uh, for example, when in doubt, make it stout or the field will leave it out. Uh, it's a design uh, little ditty we say, but one that comes to mind here, if you go to the next slide, is that uh, when all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So what's the message here? Probably there's two messages. One is don't go to space without a hammer. It's, a, it's always a useful tool in the toolbox. But the other thing is when you're going to a, a new and, and unknown job site, bring, bring a number of tools because you don't know what you're gonna run into. You can only guess. And uh, a lot of times, if, if you happen to be able to reach in there and grab a screwdriver instead of the hammer, you can get yourself out of a problem. So let's go to the next slide. So here are a couple of tools that uh, probably should be in your toolbox as you go to Mars. One, uh, and Rob's mentioned it, is uh, 3D printing of concrete. Uh, this is an image from Centennial challenge on 3D habitat design. This is printing of the hydraulic concrete that uh, Rob mentioned. It's a Penn State uh, solution. 
This is actually the uh, geopolymer type of concrete. Uh, it's really great to know there's water available on Mars. The other thing is uh, you see sedimentary rocks on Mars, which is indi uh, an indicator to me that you'll probably be able to create geopolymer or other types of cementitious binders to go with that water. Go to the next slide. So another tool would, uh, you might want to consider is uh, something like a brick lane robot. So lane bricks is uh, obviously a century old construction technique and one of the most studied construction techniques there is. On the left, you'll see some images from a gentleman named Gilbreth, who in the uh, early 1900s took a new technology called photographs and movies and started studying how bricklayers work and how to make them more efficient. And the technic techniques for laying bricks have evolved continuously since then up to this bricklaying robot, which is fully autonomous. This is, uh, there are many of them. This is one produced in Australia, for example. Let's look at another tool, go to the next one. So out of Centennial Challenge on the Habs, one of the concepts that uh, one of the teams threw around is, why don't we use the lander as part of the structure? Uh, so it, you can uh, jumpstart your vertical construction by maybe bringing that central core along with you and use the materials you find to build around that central core. Let's look at another tool. Why don't we use the lander as part of the construction equipment? So in this concept, the lander actually is a little construction ma uh, material manufacturing tool. In this case, they were intending to 3D print parts. You could use it to potentially make bricks. So all of these are, are concepts and ideas you need to be thinking about to put in that toolbox as you go to Mars. But let's go to the next slide. Has anybody ever built anything on another heavenly body? And uh, well, we've really only been to the moon. And as near as I can tell, no one's even done so much as stack one rock on top of another to see how does real construction work in space? In the next slide, we can see actually there's been a lot of construction in space. As a matter of fact, the International Space Station is arguably the most expensive project ever built. However, it wasn't built on the surface of an extraterrestrial body. So no real guidelines for building on the surface were employed here. When I say guidelines, I think of things like building codes and rules of thumb about how do you size a steel member or how do you mix your cement. And uh, searching through what I know about extraterrestrial missions, there actually is one application of building code that you can identify on an extraterrestrial body, and that's highlighted in the next slide. So it's a little jumbled here, but uh, the only off-world structure ever built that met a building code is that flagpole right there. So uh, a document called the International Building Code uh, actually in, uh, and I don't know if how it looks on your uh, screen, but it's a little jumbled up on mine, but there's a section in the building code, section 18, which deals with foundation design, actually talks about how flagpoles, specifically mentions flagpoles, uh, have special consideration for lateral loading. Uh, the reference at the bottom here is to a, another nationally recognized standard, which is the National Association of Architectural Metal Manufacturers, which tells you how to design a flagpole. But the building code here, the International Building Code, talks about the lateral support for the flag. So if you go to the next slide, 
you'll see that Apollo 11, actually the first people on the moon, uh, noticed that they had difficulty penetrating the surface and, uh, and quickly ran into resistance as they tried to drive things into the surface of the moon, which was, to quote from them, clearly evident during the deployment of the staff of the U.S. flag. And at the very end, we get our first construction report from the moon that says the soil offers very literal lateral support. So we could go back to the building code and go, oh, let's see what the building code says about lateral support for flags. So we need to expand our body of knowledge about what do we build? And maybe this is part of the moon to Mars philosophy of learning to build and learning what tools work well. Let's go to the next slide. That's been mentioned a couple times about variability of soils. And uh, I think Rob brought it up about, uh, there might be a need for precursor missions to characterize the soil you are going to land large vehicles on. And I'm a huge proponent of this. Anytime you're bringing in something heavy, uh, you need to know what the dirt's like, where you're gonna put it down. This image here from Rover, shows how quickly soil properties can vary. Just, you know, within a matter of a few inches, you go from a, in the foreground here, a very competent material to a material that has uh, obviously rather poor bearing and shear capacity. So what could that mean to a lander or a structure put in a situation like this? Well, there's an excellent terrestrial example shown on the next slide, which I'm sure everybody's seen before. This is what happens when you put something half on competent material and half on less competent material. So as we go forward uh, and, and try and say, I'm going to put four or five 40 to 60 ton vehicles down in one area, I'd highly recommend some kind of precursor mission to that. Rob touched on use of in situ materials, which is going to be critical to building large facilities. They can't all be inflatables. We shouldn't go with the philosophy as of I'm going to take and basically put an international space station on the surface. I want to build with what's there. So if you look at the next slide, I see some great stuff to build with on Mars. Nice flat rocks to stack. And if you look at the next slide, this outcropping of sedimentary rock this just has me drooling. This has me, I'm, I'm ready to get my guys and go out and start building with that because I know I can put together shelter and structure that's gonna last for a long time and it's gonna be low energy and easy to build. If you go to the next slide, examples of this terrestrially, you can find everywhere. This is just happens to be, this is called dry stacked stone, no binder whatsoever. Uh, admittedly, it's not going to be a pressure trite design, but if you're building shelter for your first robotic missions, uh, dry stack stone is, a, is an excellent choice and should be easy to do. And as you can see here, it lasts a long, long time. So what I, I want to leave you with, and maybe it's a kind of a good slide to wrap up. Uh, in my company, we built uh, a facility 1942. Uh, beginning of World War II, and there was a need to get military assets up into Alaska to potentially deter an overland invasion. And this was an advertisement for the folks who had to go and build that first Alaskan highway. And I think the message here is going to be clear for everybody going to Mars. This is no picnic, and if you're not really willing to put up with these adversities, don't apply. So. Uh, I think that's all I've got to share. Uh, a quick question on, on that and uh, something you mentioned earlier about getting your guys out there. Um, what kind of, what, what kind of modifications would you actually need to make to terrestrial construction equipment to be able to build structures on Mars? Uh, Rob touched a bit on the environmental differences. So what, what's that jump like? Well, super, super great question. The first obvious uh, answer is you're not going up there with internal combustion engines. So every 
big piece of the construction equipment you see is primarily runoff of a, a diesel engine. That's going to have to change. Probably going to be some type of fuel cell engine, maybe a hydrogen powered turbine, but uh, the, the motivator, the, the prime mover is going to have to change. The other one is there's going to be a challenge to hydraulics. So all the big excavators use some kind of hydraulic cylinder, which is a, a pressurized piston, uh, usually with oil in it. So as you get to vast temperature swings, like you see on the Mars surface, when it gets very, very cold, terrestrial hydraulics would probably not work without some significant modification. So those, I would say, are the two big ones that need to be worked on. All right, great. And we, we do have a question from Matt Kaplan. Does a civil engineer to be part, need to be part of the first Mars crew? If you ask me, they do. Uh, I'd take a mechanical electrical along with me too. <laughs> so I, I'd like to add to that. Uh, I think the future will be multidisciplinary for sure. Everybody has to have more than one skill uh, on the crew side. But also I think we have to reimagine construction uh, when we say construction today, we, we have a, a very closed mind. And really, if you look at the image behind me, this was the winner of the Centennial Challenge. And it starts with a design. And if you have robotics at your disposal and new materials, uh, you have to change the way you design your structures. And then that makes it easier to use the robots. But it's, it's a complete reimagination of construction is a clean sheet design and it will require new materials and new tools, but that's how we're gonna do it. We're not going to emulate everything we do on earth. And in turn, what we discover by doing this for Mars will feed back to earth, especially on the sustainability side of things. Everything has to be sustainable on Mars. And so we will feed that back to earth and, and it will be iterative and I, I think everyone will benefit. Uh, one more question, and unfortunately, this is going to have to be our last, again from Sarah. If you were to send a robotic precursor um, mission to evaluate uh, kind of the soil properties and conduct soil slash binder experiments, what analytical instruments and tools would you include in that payload? Well, I'll start out and say uh, there are some very simple tools that can characterize the surface for, uh, you know, say a 40 ton lander. One simple tool is something called a cone penetrometer. And it's nothing more than a metallic cone that you push into the dirt with a known amount of force. And then you see how far it goes in. Uh, if it goes in a little way, you have pretty competent material. If you can push it in a long way, then you have less competent material. So simply driving around and pushing a cone into the dirt uh, with a known force will give you a lot of information about how safe it would be to land a large object. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll add to that. I think first you use the simple tools like Pete mentioned and, and even just uh, pushing a plate down on the ground, vibrating the plate for compaction, seeing what that does. But also if you could have a small excavator and bring samples back from a, a grid that you lay out a virtual grid, bring samples back from each location, then do uh, essentially a civil engineering lab on the lander, do some triaxial testing. Then you would have all the soil properties for that civil engineers require, but it does require some ground truth, some sampling, some in situ measurements. Any instruments you wanna send, Michelle? Oh, absolutely. I want to measure the, uh, the ejecta and its velocity and size on every landed mission. All right. Well, thank you all for, for this, that great answer, and thank you all for uh, presenting today. That wraps up today's Hangouts. We'd like to thank our presenters once again, and thank you all for joining us in the audience. If you have any thoughts or ideas about future topics, please reach out at the email address on the screen. And as always, send any questions, comments, and feedback there as well. Paul or Rick, any final words? Paul? No, uh, excellent presentations, and um, I look forward to learning more.
Uh, and I would just like to add, thank again, thanks to ASU and our speakers. And I also want to thank everybody who's participating in these Hangouts. That's uh, It's by talking and sharing across communities that we're really going to figure out how to go do this thing. And so a big thank you. All right. Thanks, Rick and Paul. And uh, we hope you can join us on April 16th for our next Hangout. We'll be doing hydrated mineral mapping efforts at Mars. And until then, we'll uh, see you next time. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>